so, is the Earth full? Uh, how many human beings can there be on this planet? Uh, how can they live? Uh, would it would it rather be agricultural than uh, in the city? Um, so, how many people could there be on this planet? Um, mm. Who has an idea for that? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends very much on the lifestyle, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, to take two extremes, mm -hmm. if they all live like present-day Americans, using as much energy and eating as much beef, mm -hmm. then probably two billion might be the maximum number for a sustainable population. If, on the other hand, uh, they uh, live in little capsules, eat nothing but rice, um, and uh, live in virtual reality, then maybe 20 billion. So it could be anywhere between that. Um, but I think clearly it's the rate of change that's a uh, concern, isn't it? And uh, in the countries where population is still rising fast, namely parts of India and sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there's a risk they will get out of the poverty trap. And that may uh, allow this uh, growth to continue. And although the projections up to 2050 for world population are fairly firm, it's sort of 9 billion mm -hmm. plus or minus 1. Mm -hmm. um, beyond 2050, it's very uncertain. And uh, <clears throat> the UN projections depend very much on what happens in Africa after 2050. Mm -hmm. It could be a doubling between 2050 and 2100 in Africa, um, so that Africa then has 4 billion people. And that would mean that, for instance, Nigeria had a population equal to the sum of the United States and Europe and probably they'd be in the poverty trap still. And uh, I suppose it depends on whether um, they do uh, uh, reduce fertility to replacement mm -hmm. level. But uh, it's always said that that's going to happen if women are educated and all that. Um, but I was talking to some African who said, no, it won't, because people will like to have large families for cultural reasons. And so it's not obvious that the population of Africa will stabilise um, even if uh, people are educated. I mean, it's a sociological question, I don't know, our, but, but, our, but these are big uncertainties. Our common French, Pater das Gupta, whom you yes, quoted yes, before, yes. he did work in, <coughs> in, in South Africa, precisely on that question. Yes, yes. Mm. And he found out that attitude change, mm. once men get to the, uh, ad, uh, adopt the attitude that it is better to have fewer children mm -hmm. and you can still be considered to be a man in mm -hmm. terms of the tradition and culture, mm -hmm. you, you have fewer children. Yes, but will that happen? That's the question. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah. this is linked to culture, it's yes. linked yeah. to economic perspectives, yes, yes. because we know large families are needed when you have no insurance, um, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always a combination of it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just numbers, it's the distribution. It's the geographical distribution, where are these people, as, mm -hmm. as you said, but it's also the age distribution. Mm -hmm. Because once you have the bulk of young people, they reproduce and you mm. get more young people, mm. babies, etc. Mm. So, <clears throat> again, you have to look into it. Uh, but, but from the point of view of the biosphere, uh, if you see the size of the human population when I was young, many, many, many years ago, mm. uh, it, it seemed hopeless that there was an ex explosion of human population. The Club of Rome. Uh, mm. And even was before that, that, yes. Mm. Uh, Paul Ehrlich. Mm. Paul Ehrlich, Paul Ehrlich. Paul Ehrlich. Mm. And, and it seems now that the projections uh, coming out of the Statistics Office of the United Nations and so on say that it will sort of, there will be a steady state of somewhere between 9 and 14 billion people. Mm. And in that sense, it's, it's not, it's not going to go all wrong, but it's going to be tough. It, you, I, biologists, uh, I'm thinking of my colleague Paul Ehrlich, um, have, have this idea, not all biologists, <laughs> have this idea that there's a carrying capacity for human beings. And time and again, it's been disproved. Mm. I, I, we could have 30 billion people, God forbid, and somehow the earth or humans would still find a way to get by, mm. might be miserable, mm. and it might bring irreversibilities uh, 
into climate or even worse ones than we have. Uh, but it's very hard to define a carrying capacity. I spent 15 years of my life actually doing research on optimal population growth. And uh, I was a demographer earlier. And uh, my attitude now to this is that it depends on the criterion. But I do want to point out some things here. As Helga said, once you get uh, an awful lot of young people in the population, there's something demographers call population momentum. Mm -hmm. Japan, for example, doesn't have that much momentum. There are not that many young people who will reproduce the next generation, uh, whose children will reproduce. Africa has. So we have to allow for that. There's one other thing, and that hasn't been much talked about, <clears throat> and I'd like to toss this in. Um, having children later and spacing them is extraordinarily powerful. I worked at the Population Council in New York for several years. And one of my colleagues, John Bongartz, wrote a paper very early on. Uh, it turned out that China in the 1970s, when they came up with the one-child policy, had indeed been heavily influenced by the Club of Rome report. Not everybody in China, but a few key people were. And then China said, oops, we need to do something about all of this. My friend Bongard showed that they could have exactly the same population in the future, say, as they have now, total numbers, if everybody was allowed two children, but could space them. So maybe you get your first child if you're a woman at age 30, and maybe the next one you're allowed at age 36, or, or at least above those ages. Um, if that sounds draconian, the one-child policy was uh, extremely draconian. <coughs> Point is that uh, with better understanding of demography, uh, you can indeed uh, have better achievements, in, or at least have, there, are more, there are different feasible ways to get there. I hope, like everybody else in the West, we hope that we, can, we have free will, or we're allowed to freely choose the number of children we have. Uh, at the same time, that's not the case all over the world. And the important factors, as Martin just said, seem to be, are there good arrangements for people in their old age? If there aren't, you have to have a slew of children. Are women literate? Are uh, men, uh, have they got other ideas than just you know having women and showing how powerful you are by having a large family? I should uh, fess up and say that this is Truth be told, I have four children. I taught this subject. <laughs> and I, after my fourth child, I sort of backed off and said, well, hang on a moment. Yeah. But anyway, it's, uh, it's very important, but I'm not sure we can intervene that much. And I do think that I would. it always looks as if catastrophe is just around the corner for very large populations. And quite miraculously, fertility starts to fall. I would be astonished if the same didn't repeat in Africa. So humans are clever animals. Uh, in a sense, they know how to regulate the population in the long run. Mm. So they're regulating no. the population. No. No. It's more no. that they're, they're, uh, this is something called the demographic mm. transition. Mm. If you, have, um, if you know your children are going to live to old age, you don't have to have six, seven, eight. That, that is regulating the population, isn't it? It's regulating your family size. Yes. People in the Middle Ages used to have children. Uh, so even if you're in England, mm -hmm. you might have children. And you might call the first one Edward. Your name's Edward. You want to perpetuate the name. Maybe one or two girls. And then the next boy, you call him Edward again. So if two Edwards, the reason is that uh, it was a pretty good policy because more than half the children would die before age of five. We don't have that anymore. 
So we're, we're in a completely different demographic regime. I don't think families are calculating, uh, certainly not calculating for the national good or the, the world population mm -hmm. good, but they, they are finding alternatives to having large clan following them. The arra social arrangements become slightly different and I'm sure every case differs, no doubt, but this has been what's gone on for the last 150 years. This happened, this demographic transition happened in France before the Industrial Revolution hit. Nobody quite understood. So interestingly, uh, you, you know, the US had this transition, as you mentioned, about 100 years ago. Yeah. China did the whole thing in 10 years. Yeah. You know, it's, it's astonishing how, how that happened. By fiat. By, well, it was, it <laughs> was uh, planned. Mm -hmm. However, and, and this, I think, uh, is another important um, thing to think about, which is uh, the sizes of cities. Yeah. And uh, the fact that we're creating these, uh, in China, I don't know how many, there, there's like, you know, it's not unusual to find cities that you don't, whose name you don't know with 10 million people. <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, and it's also um, astonishes me the degree to which humans can adapt to the most uh, yes. uh, adverse conditions mm -hmm. in terms of both uh, food and uh, quality of life. And, it, it, you know, in a sense, we're a robust species, but, you know, it's, I'm not sure that that's uh, good if you want to be able to uh, limit the population because it's, it means that we'll, we'll, whatever happens, if there's 40 billion people, we'll adapt to it, right? And uh, that's going to be, uh, quality of life is really going to go down. In fact, I think the best indicator I've heard in terms of uh, this satisfaction index, not what your a uh, average income is, but you know, ask people, are you happy with the, the way that your job, your family, your life, and then you get a very different answer. It's not uh, correlated, that highly correlated mm -hmm. with uh, GDP. How do you see cities as a biologist? you like them or you don't? I think that, uh, uh, that the maintenance of cities uh, is, at the present moment, a very expensive thing. Right? So, if you think about it, how many things you have to transport uh, in order to sustain them. Uh, I think what will be a very important goal for the future is to, uh, to, to increase the sustainability of cities, right? So that, you know, they, they are not so wasteful as they presently are. And the, 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 the problem will be more and more important with time because now we are over this 50% of people living in cities and that as to say probably there will be even more. So I think this is a very important uh, thing to uh, organize cities as efficiently as possible in terms of all kinds of things, services, energy, information and so on because uh, this is, this is where most people are going to live and this is what is going to have the most impact on the planet. Is there any scientific uh, engineering style uh, imagination mm. sort of, you know, coming up in these years? Mm. Uh, people coming up with visions? Yes. Well, it's certainly true that if they spread as shanty towns, that will be disastrous. And uh, I think the projections are that Lagos will be more than 30 million people by 2030, etc. And, uh, and that's really bad news if, it, if they develop that way. Um, I suppose it's the context in which people are happy to live. I mean, I think if you can have everyone in tower blocks and they're deficient, then probably the energy consumption per person is less than if they're dispersed over the countryside, if you take account of electricity grids and transport, etc. So I think city living can be efficient in terms of energy, um, but it's very vulnerable because, of course, uh, uh, if uh, um, there's electric failure in a city, it's uh, can, uh, not only uh, uh, can you can't move in the tower blocks, but you can't do anything. So there's going to be huge vulnerabilities, and uh, we've got to guard against that. Um, and it's just a matter of lifestyle. I mean, I would far rather live in a village than in a city myself, and uh, I just hope there aren't too many people like me. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there'll be cities. Right. <laughs>
But with the internet, could you envision mm -hmm. an, uh, an age in which you could actually live in a, in a village for your own material needs, like mm. food and children and, and that friends? Would be my, that would be my ideal. And, I, and of course I do wonder uh, whether there might be some reversal. I mean, everyone says that the proportion in cities, which is now 50%, will grow to 70%. But uh, um, I do wonder if there might be uh, pressure, at least from the more sort of affluent people who have the choice, to move the other way. Um, because it is true that uh, well, with um, uh, internet and virtual reality, which we talked about earlier, um, you can have a pretty connected life wherever you live. Well, at least for in San Diego, it's, it's a reverse uh, flow. That is to say, uh, a lot of the wealthy are now coming in from their mansions as they get older mm -hmm. and want to be in, in these high rises downtown and yeah. overlooking the ocean. And, and so there are these, you know, it, it, there's a flow that goes on, mm -hmm. probably different different cities. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, 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 you know, I, I see, there's an attitude I see here, which I don't agree with, which is that I think cities are fantastic inventions. And, you know, things happen in cities. There's culture. There's uh, in the, 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 the great cities of the world, right? This is London, New York. Uh, you know, Shanghai, there, there's just uh, vibrancy there. There's the young people, creativity, art. So I, I don't, I think that's valuable. I think, you know, maybe it's expensive, but I think that this is something we need to preserve. I don't know. I, I think uh, there is a great variation in the attitudes, what lifestyle uh, people prefer and at what age. Right? So I, I actually would agree with you. Uh, that's a pers completely personal thing. I get more and more tired of large cities as I am uh, growing older. I have to say, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm not going to live in. I'm not going to live. A, I'm not going to live in a big city. I think ten years from now, uh, I can see. I can feel it very clearly. Partly because, as we discussed, I can remain connected if I want. I can go to the city, but I that kind of uh, vibration around me is actually, to me, it's extremely tiring and more tiring with age. Uh, and, but, but the good side is that we have now an increasing liberty uh, to choose because as, uh, that's important again, with, for example, with the re renewable energy, right? You mentioned the energy transportation problem. Yes. If this becomes really efficient, then households, even in the countryside, uh, can be largely self-sufficient in the future. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have to gang up necessarily very yeah. tightly. And we've been talking earlier about uh, nature and the natural world. Uh, if everyone lives in a city, then kids will grow up uh, never, never seeing a, a wild animal, uh, except in a zoo, never seeing a dark sky or anything like that. So there'll be a real loss, I think. And it will, perhaps will change the new generation's attitude towards nature. Uh, because they won't really have any intimate connection with it at all. But the animals also come to the city. You have foxes in the city now. <laughs> you have birds in the city. It's true. Deer, it's deer, actually. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. But we, we're talking diversity. And, and in a sense, uh, there has been this monotony tendency that cities grow and grow and grow, and, 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 and the, the, the villages are left behind mm -hmm. and nobody lives there anymore. So that, that's the mega trend at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, coming in a trend of moving back into the countryside mm -hmm. in some countries. But you could also ask, is there the possibility that the, the, the border between cities and the countryside will somehow evaporate a little or become more complex? Because you have urban agriculture, people wanting to take food production into the cities. Mm -hmm. You have integrating animals mm -hmm. in the cities. You have uh, also yeah. the city in the form of the internet going into the countryside. Mm -hmm. So, so yes. many of the urban cultural yes. stuff yes. and the electricity that you're talking about yes. uh, is more available to people actually mm -hmm. not living. Yes. So, so rather than having sort of cities devoid of nature and then mm. natural sort of uh, parks yes. out yes. there, you could you could you could soften the. Well, the you would have zoning mm. and green belts and things like that. You know, <coughs> like that. But you have also uh, take the case of Switzerland. Switzerland is becoming an urbanized countryside. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's inefficient um, <clears throat> in terms of energy, transportation, etc. But people you know, want to live in what they think is the countryside and yet have all the amenities, which means the whole country, and the country is relatively mm -hmm. small, becomes mm -hmm. an urbanized countryside. 
and people complain about it. Yeah, I was in Zermatt last September doing some hiking, and it, it's almost like a movie set you know, in terms of all of all of the very uh, you know I have to say you know very well manicured. Uh, Areas and you know they they have small little farms and I've I've told that they're not efficient you know <laughs> having cows up on the hills yeah. but but they do it because they want to have that feeling that they're in the countryside. I I want to come back to something we said earlier and that is that I don't you know population size is an issue urbanization is an issue but in my opinion the biggest issue to do with population is actually a geographical one. It's the one you brought up. Over many, many years, millennia, actually, there have been population settlements. For example, 2,000 years ago, there were more people in northern China than in southern China because there was a disease gradient. Things like malaria, very difficult to live in a hot and moist climate. So the population tended to settle or at least to be concentrated much more bigger cities in the north. Um, so population has now spread out and as geographically people have moved in Bangladesh into a place called the Sundarban which is uh, regularly either flooded by rains or flooded by rises in uh, or at least by tidal uh, rises. And what's happening, so you could sort of think of the population in different regions as being where people are comfortable, what works, what supports that sort of population. It's very ecological or biological. Then along comes climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to work evenly. I can quote you from, I said to my sister in Ireland, I said, what do you think of climate change? She says, we love it. It's incredible. You can sit outside and drink coffee in February. <laughs> you know? so, um, so it is not even. And there will be, as you just said, there's going to be major geographical redistributions of population. That doesn't just mean refugees, which is absolutely correct. It's going to mean wars. And so I think that the main issue to do with population is the way it's geographically distributed. Now, throughout all of this, the last two days, we've been saying, what can we do about it? Or what can science or what can the government? Not much. But I think what we can do about it at least is be aware of what the major issues are. Urbanization is a big issue and running cities properly is a big issue. But the geographical distribution is going to bring problems and those problems aren't going to be Just easy. Wait a second. Now, I mean, before you go to war, I think you should try diplomacy. <laughs> right? In there, other words, is, there is a lot of evidence that Syria got into difficulties with respect to food mm -hmm. 15, 10, 15 years ago and that possibly, I don't know, this may have had to do with climate change. Now we have the civil war and, uh, and, that, ha and that has brought on a refugee crisis, etc. I'm not saying that diplomacy is impossible. I'm not saying that there are no policies. I'm just saying if we're looking forward to what's, what are challenges in the next 30, 50 years, this is going to be huge. 